My First Sexual Experience A bead of anticipatory sweat ran down the length of my nose. My heavy inhale hoovered it brainward. I followed the thinnest hand of the classroom's clock in a full 360-degree rotation. Like clockwork, it formed the familiar right angle of three o'clock, and the school bell rang out. I leapt from my chair in a burst of youthful exuberance. This drew looks from some of my classmates, but their derisive eyes couldn't dampen my spirits. Oh no, my spirits were bone dry, because that night was the night. Not in the sense that it was the night time, which would apply to all nights, but in the sense that this was a night of great significance for me, which I will now elaborate on. That was the date I had double underlined and highlighted in my journal's calendar, next to a detailed drawing of a swastika made of penises. It was my first teen disco, and I was prepared, as my mother would say, to chase ass. I had just turned sixteen and was feeling like a big man. I'd grown five inches in a year, and my pubes were in full bloom. In other words, I was a chick magnet. Granted, I had never before spoken to a conscious girl, but with my testicles and vocal pitch getting lower by the day, I had been filled with the kind of manly confidence I imagined Burt Reynolds might have. My lip had seven hairs. The disco was to take place at a popular nightclub called Calcutta, which every second month closed its bar and opened its doors to hundreds of sexually inexperienced but virile boys eager to gain the respect of their peers by jamming a hairless finger into the orifice of a female stranger. It had become clear to me over the past two years that this act of dextral penetration was exactly the social currency I needed to finally be accepted by my male classmates. These same classmates would regularly plaud at Calcutta specifically for its volume of willing finger recipients, affectionately referred to as filth. Stories of permanent wet floor signs and an overwhelming fish smell that greeted you at the door glazed me in yet another layer of confidence and had me rushing home to get ready in earnest. My mother jumped up to greet me as I opened the door. She had been waiting at the bottom stair for some time, judging by the indentation she left on the carpet. Who's going to get their hole tonight? She asked with a maternal smile. I am, I replied, trying to sound coy, though I couldn't hide the excitement in my voice. She came over and took my face in her hands. I'm sure you'll be crawling in gash, she assured me, before planting a kiss on my salty forehead. My father had left five years previously, and my mother, fearing the results of my going through adolescence without a male role model, would regularly adopt a stereotyped male persona in an attempt to serve as both my mother and father. This she did out of love for me, as well as out of a visceral hatred of homosexuality. Do you think the girls will like me? I asked her. Of course they will, she assured me in her motherly tone, switching then to her slightly gruffer dad voice to inform me that she had thrown a pint of lager at the television when her football team had conceded a goal, and so dinner would be delayed. I promised to emulate her masculine behavior and went upstairs to cleanse myself for the debauchery ahead. My cleaning routine was extremely thorough. I have already mentioned my sweat several times, but it really cannot be understated how excessively I would perspire, particularly when I came into contact with or thought of a woman. I once took a field trip to an art museum, and upon viewing a tapestry of the Lord Jesus Christ suckling at the tit of Our Lady, I began to sweat so uncontrollably that my shoes squelched as I slinked away in an attempt to hide my erection. How I had longed in that instant to be the Lord Jesus Christ, suckling not at my mother's tit, but at the tit of a woman I was not related to, yielding not milk, but immense satisfaction. It was with dreams of tit-suckling that I stepped into the shower to wash off the day's glaze. I turned the water temperature as hot as it would go in order to fully sanitize the skin. I was able to hold back screams and maintain my balance as I writhed in pain at the water's scalding heat, motivated by the thought of my writhing fingers, which would soon be inserted into a well-lubricated meat pocket. I shampooed and conditioned until my hair achieved the consistency of fine silk, Upon exiting the shower, I opened up a new can of Lynx Africa, which I figured would make me seem exotic to women. I sprayed the entire contents of the can on my body, focusing largely on the erogenous zones, including the anus, as you can never be too careful. After a vigorous self-sniffing, I was satisfied, and went to my room smelling like a well-to-do African king, 
I had laid out the evening's outfit on my bed that morning, each article specifically selected for maximum sex appeal, and so was horrified to re-enter my room and find my jeans missing from the ensemble. Panic overcame the power of my antiperspirant, and sweat began to ooze as I upturned every surface and disemboweled every drawer in my room. But nowhere, nowhere could I find the skinny jeans that were my one-way ticket to pussy town. I collapsed on the floor, still nude, feeling as though I'd boarded a no-return train to despair town, with a stop-off in this is shit village. So dejected was I that I allowed my mother to shout my name three times before I responded with a courteous, What? I've made your favorite, came her maternal cry up the stairs. Bangers and mash, she said it as I thought it, but neither bangers nor mash could be any solace in my pantsless state. Solemnly, I put on a t-shirt and underwear to hide my shame, my shame being the pet name I had given to my flaccid penis. Entering the kitchen, I felt incapable of returning my mother's wide smile, and was compelled to stare at the ground as she plated my mash. It was on the ground, however, that I caught sight of the jeans' pant leg protruding limply from the washing machine door like the body of a car crash victim. "'You washed my jeans!' I said with joyous surprise, which masked my burgeoning contempt. "'Of course I did, honey. They smelt of ejaculate.' She had barely finished responding before I had my feet in the jeans and was pulling them up with renewed confidence. This proved something of a Herculean task, if Hercules had worn pants, as the already skinny jeans had shrunk in the wash, and getting my thighs into them was like trying to fist a rodent. But with persistence and my aptitude for wriggling, I managed to conquer them, and with a mighty effort I buttoned the fly. However, this presented a new problem. As the jeans hugged my skin so tightly, the bulge of my shame was unmistakably visible. Though to call it a bulge would have been charitable. It was more like a lump. A lump that's unimpressive size could easily be the undoing of my plans. Acting fast, I grabbed one of the girthier sausages my mother had doled out, and while she was distracted, jammed it down my pants and carefully maneuvered it into the desirable position. Now boasting a mighty bulge, I shoveled down dinner so fast I had to retch several times. It would not be the last retching of the night. Washed, dressed, and fed, I ushered my mother towards her own car, and we set off for Calcutta. Along the way, I insisted on playing the 1992 dance pop hit, I'm Too Sexy, on repeat and at full volume. I like the song, as when I sing along to it, it instills in me a sense that I myself am too sexy. This is done through something called empathy. Five minutes from our destination, my mother pulled into a side street and came to a stop. She then produced six cans of premium lager from her glove box. She placed them on my lap. I turned to her, and she stared on speaking. Her eyes cold and menacing. They communicated meaning words could not. I drank all six beers over the course of the next half hour, all the while, my mother said nothing, only stared, and occasionally tilted her head as a means of encouraging me. The warm, bitter lager coursed through my adolescent body, and even as I opened the door to vomit after my fifth can, I felt a confidence that I had never felt before. The beer had worked. My mother recognized this, and we drove on. Upon our arrival at the gates of Calcutta, I staggered from the car, my mother made some lurid sexual comment before driving off, but it proved unintelligible to me. A monotonous beat emanated from the club's interior as I stood in line, swaying slightly. Standing there, I was reminded of my trips to Disneyland when I had been hoisted on my father's powerful shoulders in long lines, waiting to meet my favorite Disney characters. However, this time, I was not hoping to curry favor with Buzz Lightyear, but was instead waiting in line for the purposes of fingoral penetration. I was flanked and preceded by the bronze bodies of teenage girls, whose immodest outfits left little to the imagination, though still covered the best bits, those being the breasts and sex organs, which I imagined accordingly. I was led in with little protest, and made my way directly to the dance floor. Once in its center, I began to dance. Each of my limbs took on a mind of their own and flailed and twisted erratically. 
Staring to the ceiling, I screamed loudly over the music to show my enthusiasm. This drew attention towards me, as I was the only person on the dance floor at the time. This was the precise reaction I had desired, and once I was satisfied that enough people had seen me, I left the dance floor and took a seat at a bar stool. It wasn't long before I saw her stumbling towards me. She was average height and unattractive, her makeup poorly applied and her guts spilled over her waistband like a pie crust. In other words, she was perfect. She started making noise before she spoke, as drunk people often do. Er, funny, she slurred. I'm uncomfortable with compliments, so I simply answered, yes. It was then that the kissing began. Suddenly her lips were on mine, or rather over mine. Her tongue shot in and out of my mouth like a dog lapping up milk. Only she was lapping up my saliva and was a human being. Needless to say, this thoroughly aroused me. But as it continued, the pressure mounted. When ought I to begin the fingering? I couldn't ask her. My mouth was being used. I slowly moved my hand down the length of her body, slowly brushing her breast as I passed, in a way that could be considered accidental. Finally, my hand arrived at the danger zone, but was impeded by a belt, a belt that was under some pressure. My fingers fumbled with the buckle, but were like useless fleshy keys. I grimaced at my predicament, and she pulled back at last. What, do you not like it? she asked. You're really big. I was about to correct her, until I realized that my penis, though erect, had been noticeably untouched. I then came to a horrible realization. Looking down at her hand confirmed that she was indeed stroking the pork sausage that bulged from my tight jeans. She saw me looking at her hand and leaned in to whisper in my ear. How about if I do this? She squeezed. Her screams rang out in my ear and the music was stopped. What she had thought was my penis had been broken into a meaty pulp in her hands. She backed away slowly, shaking and pale as snow. I have another one, I explained. But she ran away in tears taking my hopes and my dreams with her.